Okay. Okay, we're live now. So welcome to our Bible study, everybody. My name is Sharla and I'm a part of the Healing Nations team. Our YouTube channel is Healing Nations Ministry. So please do subscribe, share, like, you know, share these videos with your loved ones, whoever you feel may be interested in these Bible studies. Even if you don't think they're interested, share anyway, you may be surprised. We meet every Friday and our Bible study is um, from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. UK time. And if you'd like to know more information, you can just send us an email at healnationsministry at gmail.com. Today we're doing chapter 18 and we have Elder Mikhail presenting. So it will be really lovely. I'm going to pray and then he will, you'll hear from him next. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for another day. Um, Sabbath is getting closer and closer and I'm sure we all need the rest. Thank you for keeping us safe, Father. Please be with Elder as he presents now. I pray that you help him to do his best and that we will all learn and remember the information that's shared today and go on to share it with others. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you uh, for an introduction. It is really nice to be together again after a whole week of toil. And um, we are going to going we are going to look at um, chapter 18 of um, Great Controversy, continuing on um, what was happening in uh, the end or at the end of uh, 18th century uh, and beginning of 19th century, uh, Great Awakening. And uh, the chapter is titled An American Reformer. It is basically about one man named William Miller. What is uh, pointed out in the beginning of this chapter, he as a young experienced uh, life uh, of struggle, uh, battle with poverty, and um, that shaped him and formed him in the man, he was man of principle, uh, man who toiled uh, and, and put his energy fully into things he wanted to achieve um, and who was able to deny himself, who was able to uh, dig deeper, not only intellectually, but physically because of um, the lessons he learned when uh, he was growing up. So that was uh, engraved in, the, in his character, those values of endurance and patriotism. He was as well very um, described um, with sound physical constitution. Uh, not only intellectual strength, but uh, he was um, used to work on the farm. And uh, that is something interesting because uh, today people underestimate people who are working physically. But we can see with uh, William Miller that uh, physical labor and intellect go hand in hand. Um, although we are pointed in this um, chapter that his mother uh, was pious woman and um, although she led uh, life, quiet life of uh, piety, he um, later on in his life uh, met uh, society of deists. Uh, deism is basically belief um, that it's not total uh, rejection of God. Um, 
I think Satan in that time was quite subtle because um, everybody was uh, basically believer of some kind. Uh, so this idea of deism is uh, more subtle than atheism. It ba basically uh, presents God who created a uh, long time ago, but who is not involved in affairs of man, who, is, who set the world as a clock and it just functions on its own. And uh, this is very interesting in regards to what we are going to, to or how um, or what then um, Williams Miller life, uh, what, what, what then it took, because um, the man who believed that um, God is not involved through study of the Bible and through the study, especially of prophecies, uh, found out that God is very much involved. Uh, if you can find with me, um, just to illustrate uh, deism, what it really is, what idea it is. Uh, if you can uh, turn to Daniel chapter 1, and uh, it is when, actually, in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, my pardon, it is when King asks Chaldeans to tell him what he was dreaming and tell him his interpretation of the dream. In verse 10, the Ch Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. Verse 11. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So basically, those magicians, those Chaldeans, you could say they were uh, ancient deists, because the belief of those magicians was that there is wealth of uh, gods and that god uh, those gods are not connected with the world of men uh, we live separate and they have nothing to do with us so nobody can explain uh, the dream or say what other human being was dreaming because uh, we don't have access to that knowledge. But Daniel, uh, in verse 22, when he spoke to king, he says, he describes God as one who re reveals deep and secret things, one who is involved uh, in our history, who is not removed, who is not rem remote, as uh, deists believe. Verse 22, he reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. So um, the influence of deism uh, made confusion in Williams Miller's mind. Um, and uh, he... Um, was very much confused because he saw uh, in scripture uh, basically between comparing interpretations of the scripture uh, and um, the scripture, how he understood it. He saw many difficulties and did not know how to overcome them. And he did not feel um, 
secure, although intellectually he could explain his uh, positions. Um, but at the age of um, 34, he felt uh, impression of the Holy Spirit and uh, he felt deep sense of his condition as a sinner. So uh, whatever he believed until that point, he found unsatisfactory because he did not know what to do uh, with the understanding uh, of, of himself as a sinner. And uh, he found no assurance um, and uh, no point in life. Uh, great controversy on, on that first page of um, chapter 18 says, Annihilation was a cold and chilling thought, and accountability was sure destruction to all. The heavens were as brass over my head, and the earth as iron under my feet. Eternity, what was it? A death, why was it? Why was it? The more I reasoned, the further I was from demonstration. The more I thought, the more scattered were my conclusions. I tried to stop thinking, but my thoughts would not be controlled. I was truly wretched, but did not understand the cause. I murmured and complained, but knew not of whom. I knew that there was a wrong, but knew not how or where to find the right. I mourned, but without hope. In this state, he continued for some months. Suddenly, he says, the character of a savior was vividly impressed upon my mind. It seemed that there might be a being so good and compassionate as to himself atone for our transgressions and thereby save us from suffering the penalty of sin. I immediately felt how lovely such a being must be and imagined that I could cast myself into the arms of and trust in the mercy of such a one. But the question arose, how can it be proved that such a being does exist? Aside from the Bible, I found that I could no, get no evidence of the existent existence of such a savior or even or of a future state so very soon william miller concluded that only a uh, measure uh, for our faith or for our belief is the bible so as ad other previous um, reformers he took Bible as his only creed, as his only source of um, inspiration, and uh, he took it as God's revelation. Um, it is interesting to see that uh, these, similar to Luther, these people struggled uh, with great questions, but uh, they were serious seekers, and God answered their questions. And God brings us to uh, an understanding that we are sinners and that we need a Savior. He does not leave us in, um, in that condition where we feel low. He will lift, lift us up. So... Once he realized that only source of hope uh, and um, what will be lamp on his uh, path is the Bible, he started to read it. And um, in his memoirs, or according to uh, 
Bliss, Memoirs of William Miller, on pages 65 to 67. Uh, he says, I wondered why I had not seen its beauty and glory before and marveled that I could have ever rejected it. I found everything revealed that my heart could desire and a remedy for every disease of the soul. I lost all taste for other reading and applied my heart to get wisdom from God. Uh, this is very interesting. Somebody who uh, is in contact with philosophers and uh, great thinker, as William Miller was. And when he, once he found the message of the Bible and its beauty, he said, I would put away all other books because I found everything my heart could desire. Uh, and he started to seriously not only read, but study, study God's word. Um, and um, I was thinking, did we find, found everything we, our heart desired, or is there some place which is still empty? It might be because we did not apply ourselves to a proper study of God's word. Because uh, God uh, will work on, on the heart of uh, men and women. He will not leave us same. He will not leave us empty. He, he will give us faith. He will give us hope. Um, I'm just going to look, because I've got this version of Great Controversy. It has got different... Um, pages from original. It is in original great controversy on chapter, sorry, on page 320, paragraph one, what I want to um, mention now. This is how William Miller studied. Endeavoring to lay aside all preconceived opinions and dispensing with commentaries, he compared scripture with scripture by the aid of the marginal references and the concordance. Do you, uh, so why, why was it uh, important to lay aside all preconceived opinions and this? Dispense with commentaries. Do you are want you, to step in? Are you saying with regards to Bible study, why it's important to lay aside preconceived notions? Yes, yes. Yeah, because when it comes to um, studying the Bible, we need to come to the Bible with like an open mind uh, um, and also an attitude of humility and allow the Holy Spirit to lead because yes men wrote the bible but they were inspired of god so if you come mm. with preconceived notions you're going to try and like you know how people take verses to justify what they want to do in their life yeah. so you'll come from that approach as opposed to really seeing how god mm. wants you to lead your life you're still going to try and put your interpretation on it and and that's that's what can lead to you know error and fanaticism and all of that type of thing mm. Mm. Do you think we can? We have to still do it today, even as Adventists? Can we have some preconceived ideas? Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. I think so because the the Bible is timeless, isn't it? So mm. even even up to this day, and you know, sixty years ahead of us, unless God comes back, you know, before then, people will still need to approach it. That you know what, Lord, you lead me, guide me into all of your truth and whatever mm. ideologies I'm approaching your word with help me because living in this world we've taken on 
sometimes we don't realize as well how much ideologies we take on do you, do you see what i'm saying so mm. yeah there's a lot to unlearn um this is can i say something as well yes yes if we if we look at it with a magnifying glass on adventist mm. i've made it a a habit of mind that when i'm studying i use ellen white after mm. I've, I've, I've studied what I wanted to study. So most people would use Ellen White first and mm -hmm. that can make you, um, that can make you kind of look into the verses with a preconceived idea. Mm. But if you study the Bible first and then you use Ellen White and then marry up, then mm. you know, it, it, to me anyway, it feels better when I use the Bible first, then use Ellen White. She agrees with what I've found and we move on. So speaking about preconceived ideas, I think we can get a preconceived idea when we use Ellen White first. Not to uh, say that nothing against Ellen White before it was as anything. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say uh, in his day and age, there were great ideas uh, which were taken um, as we will see um, generally as truth that there will be thousand years of uh, Christ's reign on this earth, uh, like spiritual reign before he comes. And uh, these ideas, William Miller had to lay aside, especially as he went through the society of deists, Comparing with Bible, it, it was in disproportion. I would only say um, there is difference between preconceived idea and <laughs> reading Ellen White because she points back to the Bible. It's not like uh, she would like to say something uh, and back it up with the Bible. It's, it's rather other way around. But yes, I agree with uh, Matthew that... Um, it is a um, good habit to let the word to speak to us and change our opinions. Sorry, Elder. Yes. I was just going to say, I, I really appreciate what Matthew said, because um, I think, you know, sometimes we forget the same Holy Spirit that speaks to Ellen G. White, speaks to us mm. this in 2021. And... I, I know I've done it and I've seen other seven day Adventists specifically do it where we lean heavily on what she said, mm. but then we get lazy and we don't search for our own gems. So it's always so much more refreshing when you search for yourself. You, do you see what I'm saying? Instead of mm -hmm. just leaning heavily and her writing is so beautiful and inspirational, but it's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit. We can't be lazy. I, I will come to that point of laziness later on if I've got time because I see time is running too fast. So, yes, uh, I, I continue in that paragraph. He pursued his study in a regular and methodical manner, beginning with Genesis and reading verse by verse. He proceeded no faster than the meaning of several passages so unfolded as to leave him free from all embarrassment. When he found anything obscure, it was his custom to compare it with every other text, uh, which seemed to have any reference to the matter under consideration. Every word was permitted to have its proper bearing upon the subject of the text. Um, what I wanted to say I'm going to try to share the screen with uh, Williams Miller's um, um, rules of interpretation. Uh, what is actually um, interesting that, you know, everybody is a child of uh, its own time. And, um, you know, end of 18th century, beginning of 19th is, was a great industrial rev revolution. And people believed generally 
this wet world will become better with uh, with um, advances of uh, science, technology, and this is what uh, I believe Book of Daniel uh, tells us about the time of the end. The men will run to and fro. It it, it might be uh, taken literally. It might be um, taken as studying the Bible. The knowledge will increase. Um, and people were very positive, and that time people were very methodical. And uh, at that time, uh, there was a um, school of thought, uh, which we call today common sense thought. So uh, if you've got your method, and this method is consistent, you can learn whatever you want, you can achieve yourself. You don't need a uh, university. Um, this uh, school was originated by uh, Francis Bacon. Um, and so William Miller applied those methods in, in study of the Bible, consistency, comparing scripture with scripture. So he had 14 rules. Let me jump to rule chapter uh, rule one every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the bible and uh, if you read matthew chapter 5 verse 18 jesus says that there will not be one letter or one dot which will be changed so uh, god's word um, is written in the way that every word has got its place. Um, the verse says, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will, not know by, will by no means pass from the law, till all is fulfilled. Um, rule number two. All scripture is necessary and may be understood by a diligent application and study. As 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16 and 17 says, uh, there is um, no scripture, scripture which can be disposed of. Some people might benefit from one part of the Bible. Some, for some, it... Uh, you know, somebody likes more Psalms, somebody likes, prefers more uh, First John, but it's not to say that other uh, parts are not necessary. Uh, you, you know that uh, Martin Luther had problem with Book of James because he was, uh, that time was, uh, the works were pushed heavily. Uh, so it was kind of, sounding uh, pharisa like um, legalistic to him to read book of james but all scripture is necessary uh, for balance and for uh, understanding we we cannot choose uh, and pick our own uh, preferred uh, scripture just to back up our ideas as we said previously rule number three nothing revealed in the scripture can or will be hid from those who ask in faith not wavering uh, deuteronomy 29 29 says that those things which were written are revealed for us so god is sending us letter it's what we've got in the uh, in his word it's not to be um, obscure it sh it is revealed for us um, and with this rule three i would say correlates rule number 14 which which says the most important rule of all is that you must have faith. It must be a faith that 
requires a sacrifice and if tried would give up the dearest object on earth the world and all its desires character living occupation friends home comforts and worldly honors if any of these should hinder our believing any part of god's word it would show our faith to be vain nor can we ever believe so long as one of these motives lies lurking in our hearts we must believe that god will never forfeit his word and we can have confidence that he that takes notice of the sparrow and numbers the hairs of our head will guard the translation of his own word and throw a barrier around it and prevent those who sincerely trust in god and put implicit confidence in his word from erring far from the truth though they may not understand hebrew or greek so this is where i believe god um, preserved his word he let those who translated it so even the simplest uh, of men uh, even those who are hard laboring can come unto jesus and find rest uh, the bible was not given to mislead people to um, take them away from god to confuse them but if uh, if approached with faith it will strengthen the faith and um, will shine on the path i don't know if i should go um further in in those rules they are pretty straightforward um and you can find them on internet online those rules uh from rule let's see where i left yeah rule number four if you want to understand doctrine bring all scriptures together on the subject you wish to know uh, then let every word have its own pro its proper influence and if you can form your theory without a contradiction you cannot be in error uh, i would say um it takes time it takes prayer uh but you can see from all these points um it's not necessarily that he is so confident in himself uh, saying if you follow my rules uh you, you cannot have ever err but his confidence is in god's word god that's why is saying above all uh, rule number 14 it's all about faith in god's word if you are sincere seeker god will not lead you uh, into the darkness he will lead you into his marvelous light um, rule number five it's a reformation rule um, scripture must be its own expositor if you don't understand something in one place it will be explained by different scripture uh, don't try to that's why uh, it's important not to bring first commentaries it's good for exercising not our, only our faith but our mental capacity and reasoning um, and then from rule six he goes more specifically into uh, how god works that they are what we call today different genres in the bible uh, he god uses visions figures parables um, 
dreams um, and various um, um, various uh, genres will be read differently. So visions, for example, rule number seven are always mentioned as such. So if you go to second, second Corinthians, second Corinthians chapter 12, verse one, Paul says, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and the revelations of the Lord. So he speaks about his uh, experience when he was um, in vision or he was uh, taken um, experience heaven. But he mentions this is the vision I'm going to tell you about. And this is uh, even the vision in Daniel. It's mentioned this is the vision. So you know you are not dealing with um, you are dealing with something extraordinary in the lives of people. Then rule eight uh, deals with figures which are used in prophecies where certain, uh, certain words have uh, different meaning. But again, you can find those meanings elsewhere in the Bible. Then he talks about parables. Uh, which are used as sa same as figures, but instead of word, it's a whole story uh, which compares or illustrates uh, things, subjects. Uh, and then he goes more that the figures actually have more meaning, um, like they can stand for in the indefinite period of time or day for a year or day for a thousand years uh, with God. So you have to look in context um, when you look for uh, ex explaining figure in, in that context. And rule which some of us probably uh, know is um, he, how do we ever know if the word is used figuratively or if it's used literally. Some people read figuratively even Genesis, the beginning of the Bible. But again, uh, Williams Miller, uh, common sense approach, he says, if it makes good sense as it stands, and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. So this approach, when I was doing electrotechnical school, they told us don't look for difficult uh, problems. Solutions are usually easier when you are, um, when you've got broken appliance, look first if if the fuse is gone or if the um, if the extension lead uh, is gone don't look into difficult this uh, first go from easier explanations maybe, maybe i'm not using the um, proper example but if something can be understood literally, we don't need to say it's figurative. Rule number 12, to learn the true meaning of figures, trace your figurative word through your Bible and where you find it explained, put it on your figure. And it, if it makes good sense, you need look no further. If not, look again. So again, diligence, uh, comparing scripture with scripture. And the last, which we skipped, rule number 13, to know whether we have the true historical event for the fulfillment of a prophecy, 
if you find every word of the prophecy after the figures are understood is literally fulfilled, then you may know that your history is the true event. But if one word lacks a fulfillment, then you must look for another event or wait its future development. For God takes care that history and prophecy doth agree so that the true believing children of God may never be ashamed. We already mentioned rule number 14, um, which is about faith. And he stresses, uh, William Miller stressed that without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's uh, impossible to uh, believe or, or to study God's word. So I just wanted to quickly go through those rules. Uh, and you can look, as I said, 14 rules of William Miller and do your search on, on the scriptures. Uh, and what it does to me, it strengthens my faith in God's word. As I said, he was not boasting, if you do this methodolo methodologically, you cannot go wrong because it's my rules. But he says, uh, and he gives references. If you study God's word, he will not uh, leave, leave you in the darkness. Uh, so I close this sharing. I had some questions. Uh, we've got, I believe, only 10 minutes. Um, Yes, uh, I, we were talking that William Miller started to systematically and methodologically study uh, Bible, beginning from Genesis and reading verse uh, by verse and proceeding no further. Uh, if he did not understand the verse fully. And... Uh, he especially studied with in, intense intent or intense interest books of Daniel and Revelation. And he found out that he can apply same principles which we just went through. And uh, he saw that prophecies, as we read, were fulfilled literally. Um, and there are still some things which were not fulfilled. And uh, he saw that the Bible is a system of revealed truths, so clearly and simply given that the wayfaring man, though a fool, need not err therein. Uh, he had a dream as well uh, about the box of jewels. Uh, which somebody scattered uh, and he remember feeling of being lost, don't know how to put it back in the jewel, jewel box. But then somebody came and started to place the jewels in its proper place and it, it made sense and it was beautiful. So that dream just confirmed that the Bible is full of uh, truth, full of light, and it can shine on the path of those who are diligent students, um, and it, it will fall in, in place. Uh, the, the scripture which most uh, attracted his view was uh, Daniel 8.14, which uh, says unto 2,300 evening mornings or days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And um, at that time, as I said, 
the popular belief around was that uh, Christ will spiritually reign thousand years on this earth and then he will come. So the millennium was on this earth before uh, Christ coming. But what William Miller saw in his study of the Bible that Christ uh, will come before millennium. This is where we you heard maybe term premillennialism. Pre Basically, William Miller read uh, scriptures as Matthew 13, 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, that the wheat and tares will grow together until the harvest. Uh, and uh, when Jesus comes, uh, the wicked will be destroyed by his, the brightness of his coming. And then Revelation chapter 20 talks about thousand years of rain uh, of saints in heaven. So what attracted, as I said, his attention was uh, Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And based on Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel 4, 6, uh, I would go at least to Ezekiel 4, 6 and study previous study of the Old Testament, uh, Leviticus as well, chapter 25, chapter 26, uh, he understood that uh, day in prophecy stands for a year. Uh, so if we go to Ezekiel chapter 4, 6, can somebody read quickly? If, if nobody... Yeah, I've got it. Is it okay, four, thank you. Okay, chapter four, four, verse six. Four, four, verse six. Thank you, Moses. Okay, is it your four, verse six, reads. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. So basically, thank you, Brother Moses. Uh, basically, God had given task to Ezekiel to lay on his, um, I believe, uh, left side 390 days for iniquity of the house of Israel and 40 days on other side. And he said, each day is for one year. Uh, Ezekiel was preaching by acting out. He was like performing for God. Um, and from Numbers 14, 34, we know uh, children of Israel journeyed to promised land 40 years because of their um, complaining and unbelief. They could have entered in 40 days, but for each day they traveled 40 years. So, uh, from Daniel 8.14, William Miller understood that uh, there is prophecy about 2,300 evening mornings or days, but where will it start and where will it end? And um, what he discovered, and he was not alone, there were, were hundreds around the whole world, uh, but he was prominent one, that uh, when chapter 8 of Daniel is read together with chapter 9, it makes sense, because uh, angel uh, comes as an answer to Daniel's prayer when he felt sick after vision of two, 2,300 
days and he comes to him and he says in Daniel chapter 9, 24, that he comes to him to explain the vision and he refers specifically to the part of where one being speaks to another holy being in uh, Daniel chapter 8 um, re when referring to 2300 um, days uh, so it doesn't refer to vision as a whole there are two Hebrew words but the the um, vision or or the appearance of those two beings which speak in his vision and the other thing which is in great controversy nicely pointed um, angel tells to daniel that 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression. So in verse 24 of Daniel chapter 9, uh, there is used word determined. This Hebrew word uh, again is used only once in the Bible. I remember reading uh, some article where people were arguing what does it really mean, but the author concluded that it not only means determined, but it means cut off in its uh, simplest sense. The, the root of that word means cut something off from greater part. So you can see Angel comes to explain that part of the vision which Daniel does not understand the long time of the vision. Plus, he says, the 70 weeks are cut off from something, uh, but I like it's not only they are cut off, but they are cut off for specific reason. They are determined uh, for your people. So I think that's why uh, translators cannot uh, decide because this word has got um, like so rich meaning. Um, so I was going to just say, because I see my time is running out, uh, William Miller looked uh, where to start, and that is in Daniel chapter 9, um, in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So when was uh, the command to go forth and restore and rebuild Jerusalem come in effect? It was, uh, if you go with me to uh, Ezra chapter 7 and verse 8, just quickly. Ezra chapter 7 and verse 8. It says, And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was the seventh year of the king, speaking of the king Artaxerxes, uh, and the fifth month up of his seventh year was according to Jewish uh, calendar from 23rd of July, to 21st of August, 457 before Christ. So from year 457, we've got starting point. And uh, we know that seven weeks plus 62 weeks, 69 weeks are until uh, anointing of Messiah. That was up, up to baptism of Jesus, which is um, again established in the New Testament. And I think at this point we will have to make extra Bible study just on this um, 
on this uh, seventh day weeks. And then the prophecy goes further in the last week, in the middle of the week, he will be killed, not for his own sins, but to uh, finish the sacrifice and um, and to as verse 27 says he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week but in the middle of the week he shall bring to end to sacrifice and offering Daniel chapter 9 27 and that's what happened in the middle of the last uh, 70th week and it was in the year AD 31. By the end of this week, three and a half years later, Stephen was stoned as we have recorded in book of Acts and uh, Peter uh, had a vision on the rooftop to go and um, preach uh, to Cornelius and his household. So from that time, the uh, Holy Spirit instructed the church to go not only to the lost sheep of Israel, but to go to Samaria and to the ends of the world. And when we know now that the 70 weeks, years, 70 times uh, 7 is 490, uh, 490 from 457 BC to AD 34, when we don't count uh, year zero because it's uh, not a year, um, from 1 BC to uh, 1 AD, we come to AD 34, we know that this was cut off from greater part, which is 2,300 years. So we know that there is 1,810 years left. And that's what William Miller realized in year 1818. And he reached this solemn conviction, uh, just citing straight from Great Controversy, that in about 25 years, Christ would appear for the redemption of his people. Uh, and this is when I wanted to bring last questions. What conviction fills our heart when we know these things? Uh, do you want to share anything? Maybe it's personal to you, but um, do we have joy that Jesus comes soon? As a as, uh, great controversy says, uh, on page three, three nine two. I need not speak, says Miller, of the joy that filled my heart in view of the delightful prospect, um, nor of the ardent longings of my soul for a participation in the joys of the redeemed. Do we see uh, that clearly? ahead of us of course we will learn uh, that his expectation was uh, that when 2300 years will be fulfilled jesus will come back to this earth and he will clean it with the fire uh, because um, cleansing of the sanctuary he interpreted as cleansing of this earth in the fire, but we will uh, look at it closer in next chapters. So my question was, what conviction fills our heart when we know these things? When we know these things, when we uh, know the sure word of prophecy, when we know that we live in the last days. And the next question is, 
When we know these things, what do we do for others? I wanted to read um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. Matthew 10, 8. Um, is it possible to just probably... Give yes, yes, step question, in, please. The first question. Um, for me, in relation to the conviction, I'm, I, I always go back to Jesus' prayer that, um, in Matthew chapter 6, when he says, Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. And when he speaks about um, the, king that's the, the kingdom that's to come, it's not the kingdom of the new world mm. order that is coming, but it's the kingdom where there won't be any sickness, there won't be any disease, um, there won't be any blind people um, and everything will be according to the order that God had established it. I believe this is a conviction um, that Christ is trying to bring out when he's saying, when we pray that kingdom come, pray for um, to be part of a kingdom that there is no sin, there is no suffering, that sin comes to, uh, has come to its end. Uh, and I believe when, when we truly embrace those principles that, this is the kingdom of, that God wants us to be part of. Um, I believe it brings conviction to share it with others so that um, those who are sick, those who don't have hope, can at least have hope that the kingdom mm -hmm. that Christ is saying that we should pray for in the Lord's Prayer is a better kingdom than the one Satan is planning to set up in our time. Thank you. Thank you. If anybody else wants to share, I was just going to read second part of uh, Matthew chapter 10 verse 8 it says freely you have received freely give and that's what was weighing on Williams Miller heart uh, he uh, was convicted that he needs to share what he knows with others to help others uh, and he was putting it off in in that chapter it says it was with help of others when he accepted um, public speaking um, and it, it was with help of um, some very experienced people who uh, schedule his meetings and printed leaflets and charts and um, so it was not only his effort but effort of whole team uh but what i found interesting i want to say at the end is the question do you know why was miller hesitant why did miller hesitated to present his views what were the reasons i think one of the reasons were he didn't he didn't feel he was qualified mm. you know he was just a, a farmer yeah. and you know people may look at his background and and think well well who are you you're not qualified to to, to tell us to prepare for god's coming mm. thank you thank you that's how we might feel uh many yes Yes. Sorry, I was just going to say, as Matthew said, that it made me chuckle human nature because that's the same thing that they did thousands of years before that to Jesus. Oh, he's from Nazareth, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> we never think anyone's qualified. Um, so that's why, why we might be hesitant uh, as well, um, that we might be rejected. We might, you know, today people say, you know, um if some doctor or professor comes they will say what he has done what articles he wrote and uh just before he arrives but people have got attitudes even maybe in this pandemic if somebody is a health professional it's presented on news as a truth uh, but if you want to heal naturally uh, and using natural remedies it, it's scoffed or looked upon as unscientific although it might help uh, if not better <laughs> um, but 
Williams Miller fear was not uh, because of opposition from ungodly. And that's what I found very interesting. Uh, that let me find again where it is in original uh, numbering. Cannot access. If, if you've got this book, The Great Controversy, um, with picture of chess, it's <laughs> page 173 on the bottom. And um, in I think in original, it will be on page 329 or 330. It says, he expected to encounter opposition from the ungodly, but was confident that all Christians would rejoice in the hope of meeting the Savior they professed to love. His only fear was that in their great joy, at the prospect of glorious deliverance, so soon to be consummated, many would receive the doctrine without sufficiently examining the scriptures in demonstration of its truths. He therefore hesitated to present it, lest he should be in error and be the means of misleading others. That can happen today. I don't think we are hesitant to present something if we are full of it. Uh, and people uh, in church sometimes accept uh, things only because somebody shares it with great enthusiasm without studying for themselves. But William Miller was very careful and it was part of his fear that in case he might be wrong, he will mislead the others. So he spent further five years of studying, making sure that every objection uh, is removed. He was uh, putting some questions uh, to his study, which he was answering to himself. And finally, in, in 1831, he accepted uh, public meetings and people were moved and converted. Uh, there were at his meetings, hundreds converted and, and um, um, God's word would never return void. Uh, it was after careful study, it was nothing like, uh, oh, I know something and straight behind the pulpit. And what, what this chapter um, tells me personally, that God can change heart of those who are atheists, who are deists and philosophers like William Miller. And it's even more amazing that these people are those who present a prophecy in the Bible and present it with greatest enthusiasm. As I said, people who were like uh, uh, astrologers or um, Chaldeans in Daniel's time did not believe that God is involved in affairs of men, uh, same as deists. Uh, they thought God just started something like Big Bang and now it runs as a clock. But together with uh, Daniel, with Prophet Daniel, uh, William Miller could say that God uh, reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. And he's he is able to reveal these things to uh, diligent students that his word will lead everybody on the path of uh, light, not on the path of darkness. So that's me for this chapter. I'm well over time. So 
that's where I want to finish because I think we will go deeper in next chapters. Well, if you've got any questions, comments, just you'll find the time. You'll find the time because it finishes at nine. That's okay. Fast. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was half past. Sorry. No, it's fine. So, anyone, any questions or comments? Sorry, just, just probably just one question. Um, you know, just using the rule number eight in relation to great controversy, um, pre twenty nine paragraph two, where it where it says that in eighteen, sorry, in eighteen eighteen. Sorry, let me just go to the top. Um, in eighteen eighteen, he reached a solemn conclusion that in about twenty five years, Christ would appear for the redemption of his people. Um, I just probably want to ask a question in relation to, in relation to this question, because 25 years added to 1818 should bring you to um, 1843. Um, yeah. And um, I, I, think, I think it was rule number eight. <clears throat> rule number eight emphasized the um, figurative, um, figurative use of, of work. Um, and so the question, probably I want to ask is why is it that the, the Millerites believe that Christ would come um, around parts of the time period in 1843? Um, yeah. Were you asking, Brother Moses, how come they uh, did not make it uh, they did not expect it Christ straight away in 1844 autumn. Um, uh, yeah, why, why? I guess probably my question is why is it that they expected him to come at Passover in a sense that they didn't yeah. expect Christ to come in December 1843, but they expected him to come around March time here, which was Passover. I'm thinking, why did they expect him to, to like to come at Passover? Uh, I believe this is where um, William Miller was focusing his attention. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just looking for that rule which says you cannot go wrong. <laughs> uh, if everything, obviously, we we all grow in um, understanding. They came. William Miller was from Baptist Church, others from Methodist Church, from Christian Connections. Um, and um, I cannot find the. Yeah. I believe uh, that first of all, the, the, the mistake. Uh, it was not a mistake on, uh, in the Bible. It was, uh, again, um, first about 1843 mistake about maths, uh, counting with zero year. Uh, and as well, it was uh, comparing... Uh, I believe Babylonian calendar and Jewish calendar, why they believed uh, that the prophecy should be fulfilled in the spring rather than in autumn. Um, because they were not sure exactly when the fifth month uh, was, if that was in the autumn, uh, I mean, in the spring, or in the autumn, when, when did exactly Ezra come to Jerusalem and when uh, the decree uh, actually went forth, when it started to take effect. I don't know if that answers your question, Brother uh, Moses. Um, um, I guess probably the, the, the reason for, for me asking the question is, um, I, um, you know, when I look back in, in, in history, like when the children of Israel were delivered um, from Egypt, there was that 
physical deliverance at Passover. And then Christ came and he died at Passover as well. So there's that spiritual deliverance. So I'm, I was thinking that the mirrors were also mm. using that both the um, physical deliverance and the spiritual deliverance at Passover. Um, so that's why they, they, they were hoping that mm. Christ would come back um, according to the Jewish calendar, as you mentioned, um, around January and March, not in December, so to speak, because they were yeah. going according to the, the Jewish calendar. But um, uh, I know that, as you mentioned, they, they, they found a mistake because Christ wasn't, um, the, the understanding as the, quote, the the other chapters are going to bring to you is that Christ was moving from holy to most holy. He wasn't yeah. coming back to, um, he wasn't coming back to, to, to the earth. And um, the Millerite time period really was pointing more to um, the investigative judgment crisis beginning his work in the, the most holy place. Yeah. Uh, but definitely I see it in relation to us that Christ is going to come back to deliver us both spiritually and um, literally from, from sin. And that's why I, I guess Passover was such a big um, was such a big aspect because it, it symbolized both deliverance from both literal, um, mm. literal sin or, or from the literal world and the spiritual deliverance as well. Mm. Thank you. Was there anything else in this chapter you, you would like to bring out? Because I believe there was so much more I could go into. I, I could have mentioned as well that uh, God, uh, although William Miller was the main uh, protagonist or main reformer in America um, during uh, Great Awakening, there was there were others like. Uh, Josiah Litch, um, who God used just at the right time, just to strengthen the faith of believers. Uh, because when it came uh, to first disappointment, if you, when, when you mention it, Brother Moses, um, people could have said, you know, uh, if there was just one man who who said this is the explanation, uh, people could have said, oh, maybe he was wrong. But there were others who with precision predicted events like uh, fallen, fall of uh, Ottoman Empire in 1840. And uh, all this uh, strengthened uh, faith um, of people in, in God's word, in, in prophetic word. And I believe God uh, has a timing and he used various people, same as he used people uh, from different walks of life to write the Bible. He used people from various uh, walks of life, from farmers, fishermen, or whoever Martin Luther was, um, educated man, John Haas, professors, uh, to interpret and reform people and bring them back to, to the Bible, to God's word. Uh, this chapter actually finishes saying that... Uh, just stressing that point that God wants to lead uh, out of darkness and uh, it's um, 
two paragraphs before the end of chapter. It says, in view of the testimony of inspiration, how dare men teach that the revelation is a mystery beyond the reach of human understanding? It is a mystery revealed, a book opened. The study of the revelation directs the mind to the prophecies of Daniel, and both present most important instruction given of God to men concerning events to take place at the close of the, this world history. And I, I believe that uh, it is no different today. It's even more important as we live closer to Christ's second coming. And I believe we've got much more to learn from those people uh, who were pioneers, not because of their wisdom, but because uh, they were faithful uh, students of God's word. And uh, they happened to live when the knowledge increased and when the book of Daniel was uh, unsealed. Uh, so that's uh, what I would say. Uh, we will look even in next chapters into. So I don't want to overwhelm with uh, many points and many uh, information today. And I want to thank you for your input. Thank you so much for the presentation, Alda. It was really lovely. Um, please, can you pray to close for us? Yes. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we would like to thank you today that you have revealed um, to us what you are going to do and uh, you don't leave us in the darkness about your movements. You said that you do not do anything unless you would reveal, reveal it to your servants, prophets. And uh, we have your word. We have got especially books of uh, Daniel and Revelation, which are important for us for the time we live in. Father, help us to find fulfillment and joy uh, in studying your word that we would same as William Miller we would not we would find um, all our needs fulfilled and we'll find it um, irresistible to study your word and to put it in front of um, all the hobbies and um, work even above family that it will become uh, the most important thing to know you and know the time we live in we pray in jesus name amen amen